Hi, good morning. Welcome to Grand Rounds. Now, fully into winter. And we're really delighted to have Dr. Brian Appleby with us today, who is the director of the National Prion Disease Pathology Service um, Surveillance Center, as well as an associate professor in the departments of neurology and psychiatry and pathology, all at the Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. Dr. Bapke received his undergraduate degree in biology and philosophy from Goucher University, and then his medical degree from Georgetown University, where he also completed his first year of his training at Georgetown. And then his residency was completed in psychiatry at Johns Hopkins University, where he then went on to do a fellowship in geriatric psychiatry at Johns Hopkins. And throughout the course of his the career has done so much to help us understand and heighten our diagnostic acumen for other forms of dementia, spongiform diseases and frontotemporal dementia, and helping us to delineate much more clearly for our patients what it is that they're suffering from. He is a champion of rare diseases and has done a tremendous amount as well working with the foundation that supports patients struggling with kreutzfeldt jakob disease to support them and their families through what, of course, is a terribly, terribly painful and disruptive disease for the patients and for their lives and for their families. And in that regard, I think he's done a great deal to model how it is that we can work most effectively with patient advocacy organizations to advance their care and also the science related with the diseases that are of interest to them. Dr. Appleby, it's really an honor to have you with us today and welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Um, just as background, uh, this talk is supported by the CJD Foundation, which is a patient advocacy group for uh, patients and families affected by the disease. They're also an excellent uh, educational resource, not just for family members, but also for clinicians. So they wanted me to drop off some DVDs and information. Uh, their website also is excellent. And then we do also have a New York uh, public health uh, Representative here, Alice, as well, um, who works very closely with uh, clinicians in, in epidemiology of, of prion disease and, and other diseases. Uh, so disclosures, uh, no financial disclosures. There's no money to be made in this field whatsoever. <laughs> so don't go into it for that. <laughs> Unfortunately, we, we have no treatment or cure for prion disease. So any medication that we talk about will be off-label, uh, either investigational or for supportive management. So today we'll understand the key elements of diagnosing CJD, uh, which has drastically changed within the last five to 10 years. I was telling someone earlier, uh, the way I diagnose Alzheimer's today is pretty much the same way I diagnosed it as an intern. Um, but the way that I've uh, diagnosed CJD has changed probably about three times since I first started in the field. And we'll demonstrate some strategies for managing, managing patients with CJD. And then also we'll talk about some of the uh, risks and non-risks of uh, dealing with CJD patients from an infectivity standpoint. So what's a prion? Prion stands for proteinaceous and infectious. Uh, it's basically a transmissible protein, so there's no nucleic acid uh, associated with uh, the prion protein. It's, it's simply a transmissible protein. Uh, and when it basically oligomerizes, it forms these very tight amyloid plaques, which are very difficult to sterilize and decontaminate. And the way the protein paradigm works is we all have uh, these normal prion proteins, yellow, PRPC, it stands for cellular prion protein. It's mainly expressed in the brain, but also in the gut. Uh, we don't know exactly what its physiologic function is. It probably has some neuronal housekeeping functions, some second messenger functions. And then for whatever reason, either we have an exogenous introduction of the abnormal prion protein or uh, we have a post-translational protein modification of our normal prion protein. We have the PRPSC, which stands for uh, scrapie protein. And then it acts like a template and takes normal prion protein and converts it into itself. And you get fibrillization with oligomers and that breaks. So basically you get this autocatalytic reaction of more and more pathologic prion protein that's being produced. So when people talk about the prion paradigm, that's what they're talking about. 
the abnormal prion protein, in addition to being transmissible in that fashion, also is neurotoxic. Most people think of prion disease, they think of uh, mad cow disease, right? Because that's kind of how it was taught. I think everyone in, in med school plus, you know, how can you miss it in the media uh, if you're of a certain age? But truth be told, the vast majority of cases of prion disease are what we call sporadic. And uh, the idea behind sporadic CJD is that it is a post-translational protein modification of the normal prion protein. And there's a precedent for that in other neurodegenerative illnesses, such as Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, frontal temporal dementia. But that's about 85% of cases. 10 to 15% are due to a genetic mutation of the prion protein gene. And they have various names based off their clinical and pathologic presentation. So you have genetic CJD, fatal familial insomnia, and gershwin strauss schenker syndrome. And then by far, the least common are the acquired forms. So that includes things like Kuru, iatrogenic CJD, and variant CJD, which is CJD uh, due to mad cow disease in humans. And we'll talk about all these individual diseases later on in detail. In general, CJD is a younger onset dementia, and you can kind of break off the uh, average age of onsets by etiology. So variant CJD tends to occur in extremely young people. So in the UK, after the mad cow epidemic, most people that got variant CJD were in their teens, 20s, and 30s. Genetic CJD tends to be more of an illness of midlife, so 40s, 50s, and 60s. And then sporadic CJD is more of a disease of mid to late life with a mean age of onset of about 62, but with a lot of variability. So in this country, we've had sporadic prion diseases as young as 14 and as old as 98. Um, but most people tend to get it uh, in their 60s. Most people also know uh, CJD is a rapidly progressive disease, so the mean duration from illness onset to death is about four to six months. Uh, as we've talked about uh, prior to the talk, uh, it's difficult to diagnose. Sometimes it takes a while, and uh, that means that there's a mean duration from diagnosis to death of about 28 days. So people generally are diagnosed late, late stage illness. Uh, so about 80% will pass. Um, within one year. 20% of people do live longer than a year. Uh, so that does happen. Occasionally you'll see people live two to three years. Unusual, but it does happen. So epidemiology wise, the number that's usually thrown around in textbooks is one in a million. Uh, that's an incidence number, so it's important to remember that that's one new case per million individuals per year across all ages, but as we just discussed, uh, it doesn't generally affect all ages. Groups. It tends to be a mid to late life illness. And truth be told, the, the harder you look for it, the more likely you'll find it. So in countries that have pretty robust surveillance systems, um, that incidence number is closer to two per million per year. Uh, I don't like the one in a million number because it's a little misleading. People don't remember it's an incidence. We also use that phrase to connotate rarity in and of itself. So perhaps a better way to look at it is how many deaths occur each year in the U.S. And if you estimate that, it's about one in every 6,000 to one in every 10,000 deaths each year are due to CJD. CDC recently uh, did another appraisal of this, and it's about one in 7,000 now deaths are due to CJD. So that's also a lifetime risk. Uh, so if, for example, you go to a football game, football stadium holds about 20,000 people, you're going to expect a handful of people in that stadium to have developed CJD at some point during their life. So again, it's not a common disease, but perhaps not as rare as you uh, maybe once thought it was. So people in specific fields will definitely see CJD. Uh, that includes neurology, psychiatry, ophthalmology. And I think more and more we're seeing, as medicine's moving more to hospitalist roles, that sometimes we're managing uh, neurology patients. Also, hospitalists are, are seeing a lot of CJD as well, because most of the diagnostic workup is done in patient. So if you take New York City, for example, uh, you have about 9 million people. Uh, so you would expect 9 to 18 new cases of CJD every year. Again, 20% are going to live longer than a year, so that's a remainder of two to four cases. So it wouldn't be unusual and actually would be expected to have 11 to 22 active cases in New York City at any one time. So again, it's not a common disease, but uh, you probably are seeing it to some extent. Uh, Probably not every year, but probably at least once every 10 years, uh, depending on your role in the hospital. 
The only way to definitively diagnose CJD and to also determine what type it is, is neuropathologic examination. And we coordinate autopsies from around the country at the surveillance center. It's funded by the CDC. So if you ever have any suspected cases, if you let us know, families agreeable, we will help you coordinate the autopsy with no cost to you or the patient. Um, when we get brain tissue, we do two types of tests. We do H&E staining. Uh, you can see uh, those large holes or vacuoles in the brain parenchyma, which actually gave rise to the initial term for prion disease, which was a spongiform encephalopathy because of the sponge-like appearance of the brain underneath the microscope. And then we can take an antibody against the abnormal prion protein, do immunohistochemistry, and you see those brown deposits, which are basically prion protein plaques being deposited in the brain parenchyma. Now, there's two ways to get a definitive diagnosis via neuropathology. One, of course, is autopsy, but you could also do a biopsy. In general, we highly recommend against doing a brain biopsy, especially in cases of suspected prion disease, because it's really not needed anymore with some of the diagnostics that we'll talk about. It also causes injury to the patient, extends their hospital stay. Again, remember, average time from diagnosis to death is already 28 days. Um, and also, it potentially exposes our staff to high infectivity tissue via the brain. Uh, there are certainly use case scenarios for a brain biopsy, but they're usually in cases where uh, you're uncertain if it's CJD or CJD is not suspected, and you need that brain tissue to confirm a diagnosis like a vasculitity or autoimmune encephalopathy, um, or to help guide treatment for, say, something like a neoplasm. But if you have a case of suspected prion disease, uh, it's really not necessary to biopsy that case. So although that's the only way to definitively diagnose CJD, we do have um, tests and criteria that are pretty reliable um, in confirming the diagnosis, anti-mortem. And I'm going to review two types of criteria. One is old criteria that really came about in 2009, and it's partially combined with the age-old WHO criteria from 1998. And then I'm going to review new criteria that's came out within the next two months, which is very, very different. So the old criteria, basically, it's kind of how you do most uh, behavioral neurology. You look for some type of uh, clinical syndrome that resembles the illness that you're looking for. So in this case, for CJD, it's dementia with two or more clinical signs, like myoclonus, uh, cerebellar or visual symptoms, which often look like a gait ataxia maybe a cortical blindness. You get pyramidal or focal weakness, extra pyramidal symptoms, Parkinson's-like Parkinson's symptoms. And then at the very end stage of the illness, you get something called akinetic mutism, which is the lack of volition of speech or movement, which is arguably not that helpful for diagnosis because it happens at the end of the illness. But basically, you need dementia with at least two of those symptoms. And then you can use a variety of different diagnostic tests that can suggest prion disease or not. The first one that was developed was EEG. And you can see periodic sharp wave complexes. Uh, we'll talk about that and, and kind of the, the lack of utility of that now. Uh, everyone knows 1433 protein. Um, honestly, it's kind of our bugaboo. Uh, if it were up to us, we'd probably remove that from all criteria because it's extremely misleading. It's an extremely nonspecific marker and will be positive in pretty much uh, any neuronal injury, such as seizures, MS brain injury, Alzheimer's disease, if they sneeze when they have the LP, what have you. Uh, very nonspecific. And then uh, more recently, starting in 2009, there have been brain MRI criteria, which has been actually quite helpful, and we'll talk about that. So that's the old criteria. The new criteria that's really been released by CDC in the last two months is uh, extremely different and, and, quite frankly, quite exciting. Uh, so now... Uh, we have a new test called RT-QUICK, which we'll talk about. It's, a, it's extremely specific. So it's about 99% specific because it actually detects the abnormal prion protein itself. And uh, now the only clinical symptom you have to have is a very vague neuropsychiatric disorder. So you could argue you, you only really need one neuropsychiatric symptom with a positive RT-QUICK for uh, criteria for probable CJD. So that's quite different from criteria in the past. And we'll talk about what that means uh, later on and how we do that test. So it's important to remember that we talk about all these symptom criteria, um, but it takes a while for these symptoms to evolve, right? So again, that's why the average time from diagnosis to death is 28 
days because people have to wait for the evolution of the clinical syndrome. But when you look at how patients present, um, only about 13% of patients will initially present with that classic CJD phenotype of dementia, myoclonus, and cerebellar ataxia. Uh, the plurality of patients are actually present with a nonspecific cognitive syndrome. So a lot of times they present to their family doctor or to their neurologist uh, for a workup of dementia. 17% will present with a pure visual presentation. Uh, and these patients often will get misdiagnosed as having a stroke because they also tend to be of rapid progression and they have there's brain MRI findings that are sometimes misinterpreted as a stroke. So just keep in mind that uh, the vast majority of patients will not present with that full clinical CJD spectrum of symptoms uh, and will present with, again, that nonspecific neuropsychiatric symptom. So that's where the, the new criteria is really helpful. So this is an example of uh, EEG of a patient with um, sporadic CJD. Um, you will not see periodic sharp wave complexes in all cases of CJD, and when you do, it only tends to occur during a very certain time point of the disease. So um, if you don't see periodic sharp wave complexes, it doesn't mean that they don't have CJD. Uh, if you do see it, however, it is fairly specific for CJD, so that can help your differential. Nowadays, we really use EEG to rule out other mimickers, so uh, namely that seizure disorders, uh, but we still have it in the criteria. This is an example of a brain MRI of a patient with CJD. We typically look at diffusion-weighted imaging sequences, and we'll see one of two potential findings. We'll either see hyperintensity in the basal ganglia, so in the caudate and putamen, or you'll see it in the cortical ribbon. Most patients will present with both of these findings. Occasionally, you'll see subtypes where they only have the basal ganglia or they only have the cortical ribbon. About 5% of sporadic CJD will not have a positive brain MRI, so that's important to know. What's also important to know is that uh, brain MRIs are often misread by neuroradiology as this often looks like artifact, so it may be misinterpreted as artifact, or if it's not as diffuse as you see in this image, if it's more focal, say, to a parietal occipital region, they may uh, say that it's suggestive of stroke. So it is important to look at the MRIs yourself and in cases of suspected CJD. So the example I like to give of how MRI has changed diagnosis is a case that we referred to us for suspected CJD. His chief complaint was that he did yoga every morning and he could only do headstands now for two minutes at a time. This was his chief complaint. Imagine writing that. <laughs> So as you can probably imagine, we see a lot of psychiatry coming through with suspected CJD. Everyone thinks they have fatal familial insomnia. Um, so we did the exam, completely normal neurologic exam. And we did a cognitive exam. He had a MOCA of 27 out of 30, which is definitely within the realm of normal. This was actually his MRI. And this gentleman died um, two months later of autopsy-confirmed CJD. So what had happened was... Um, the weekend before he saw us, who was in a bike race, he fell off and hit his head, and that prompted the neurologist to get the MRI. The neurologist saw this MRI, freaked out, sent him to us. Um, so one could argue that he really had no symptoms, although he probably had some cerebellar dysfunction, right, because of the headstand chief complaint, but also possibly that's why he fell off his bike. Um, so this is an example of MRI capturing person with uh, suspected CJD before it was clinically suspected, really. And we see this a lot now in behavioral neurology clinics. When people go for a dementia evaluation, the only symptom they have is this cognitive disorder. CJD is not suspected at all because they have no other symptoms. As part of their routine workup, they get an MRI, and that oftentimes is the, the first initial suspicion of prion disease. So uh, MRIs really allowed us, I think, to capture cases much earlier, earlier than what we were able to before. So we have a variety of uh, CSFs uh, tests that we do. So we do three CSF tests at the Prion Center. Two of them are markers of neuronal injury, so they're nonspecific. 1433 is reported as positive, negative, or ambiguous, but I would argue 1433 itself is ambiguous because, again, it's very nonspecific. Um, it is fairly sensitive, though. So about 85% of cases will have a positive 1433. But as a clinician, I don't even look at 1433 anymore. 
Uh, we keep it because it's a legacy test, if you will, um, and everyone knows about it. So um, we would probably miss samples if we didn't include it in our panel. Tau is a little bit more helpful. It's still nonspecific, but it's at least quantifiable. So generally, the higher the number, the more likely it is to be prion disease. So for example, in a normal person, tau would be 200 to 300, and something like Alzheimer's or frontal temporal dementia would be about 400 to 500. CJD, typically it's in the thousands. So a little bit more helpful, but really the test that has been um, kind of revolutionary, as you can see from the new criteria, is this RT quick, and that's because it detects the abnormal prion protein itself. And the way we do that is real-time quick start, uh, stands for um, real-time quaking induced conversion. Quaking is just a very fancy way of saying shaking. They didn't want to use shaking an acronym because that would require an S and that would not be uh, politically appropriate to be saying during a talk. So uh, they use quaking instead. And it really takes advantage of the prion paradigm. So we have a 96 well plate and in those wells we put recombinant normal prion protein. So that's the substrate. And then we add the sample which presumably has abnormal prion protein in it. And then we add thioflavin T which is a uh, stain, if you will, for uh, oligomers. For lack of a better term, we put it in a shake and bake oven for about 60 hours. It has cycles of shaking, resting, shaking, resting, temperature elevations, uh, and then declines. That basically does it, converts that kinetic energy. And if there is abnormal prion protein um, in the sample, it will do the prion paradigm. It will convert the substrate, PRPC, into more prion protein and cause that autocatalytic cycle, amplify the abnormal prion protein, the thioflavin T will bind to it, and then you get these um, fluorescent curves, which show that there is seeding activity of abnormal prion protein. Uh, so basically, this is oversimplification, but it's a PCR for proteins. Uh, so it's able to detect very minute amounts of abnormal prion protein, even if it's not in concentrations likely to be infectious. We're able to amplify that and able to detect it. You wouldn't expect abnormal prion protein in any other condition, so that's why it's very specific. So this test is being used across uh, the world now, and if you compare it to 1433, you see it's not only more sensitive, but also much more specific. Um, you know, most labs approaching 100%. So um, a couple of years ago, we published a paper our sensitivity was 95% specificity, was 100%. We since have reviewed uh, our series again, uh, since now we have more at atypical cases. So over the last three years, we've received 10% were positive, and the uh, um, sensitivity for sporadic CJD is about 93%. It's less in genetic prion disease, about 70%. Specificity is 99%. We've only had one false positive. Uh, of all the 10,000 samples that we've had. Uh, so it, it, you can see that the extreme power of RT Quick allows you to kind of have a little bit broader clinical criteria than what we were able to have before with, with more nonspecific diagnostic tests. So I do like to talk a little bit about the difference between Mayo and Surveillance Center 1433. If you order 1433, your lab will either send it to us or to Mayo. Uh, 1433 is done differently. We do Western blot, they do ELISA. Um, but I think more importantly, if you want tau, you have to remember to order it. Um, whereas if you send it to us, you'll automatically get all three tests. You don't even have to remember what you're ordering. Just send us a sample and say, we think it's prion disease, and we'll report back 1433 tau and RTQuick. Um, RTQuick's uh, only available through the prion center because uh, you need prion to be able to do it because we're amplifying prions. Um, but again, if you send it to us, you don't have to remember what you're ordering. We'll give you all of those results. Um, it is important to check with your lab. Sometimes your lab may contract with certain organizations, may just automatically send it to Mayo without your knowledge. Uh, so just make sure you know where it's going when you order it. Uh, the other perk of sending it to the prion center is if you have a positive result, we do report that to the public health departments of the state and we also will follow up with you about our autopsy program um, to see if you and the family are interested in that. We can help you coordinate that. So oftentimes, 
uh, clinicians will call us because of the very specific situation. So they have a case with suspected prion disease. They're RT, they're uh, RT quicks negative, but they're 1433 and tau are positive. And they want to know, well, what do we do in this situation? And usually our recommendation to them is first re-examine the diagnosis. So the number one rule of diagnosing prion disease is not diagnosing prion disease, right? Because there's so many treatable mimic, mimics. You don't want to miss something like a treatable autoimmune encephalopathy or CNS whipples, as we were talking about earlier. Um, so you want to look at the clinical phenomenology. Are there other uh, neurologic syndromes that you have to consider? Uh, most of these patients will undergo the quote-unquote million-dollar workup for rapidly progressive dementia. There are a lot of really good review articles out there that will have algorithms that you can follow for what tests to order. Um, I see these patients in clinic, and I still follow that al algorithm or have an order set because it's just too much to remember. Um, it's many, many tests because uh, the differential is quite um, broad. Uh, oftentimes, unfortunately, with so many tests, uh, just by chance alone, tests will come back positive. You want to make sure that you follow up on the positive test results, make sure that they're not clinically relevant for your patient. Uh, so, for example, if they have how high a total protein on CSF or they have an autoimmune marker, um, make sure that they don't uh, require a empiric trial of steroids or IVIG. Do you have any other diagnostic tests that are suggest the prion disease that could help you have more confidence in your clinical diagnosis? So do you see periodic sharp wave complexes on EEG? Do the brain MRIs look like prion disease? So that can be helpful. And then not to go down the rabbit hole too much, but again, about 8% of sporadic CJD will not have a positive RT quick, and 5% of sporadic CJD will not have a positive MM, uh, MRI. So um, if you have a case that's negative across the board, it doesn't mean that they don't have prion disease. It could mean that they're a very rare atypical subtype, something like sporadic fatal insomnia, um, or a genetic prion disease like gershwin strassler schenker syndrome, or variant CJD, which tends to have negative 1433 RD-quick, and MRIs look different. Um, so if you're in this situation, we're always uh, willing to help you kind of walk through things. Um, because we don't expect that you know, people are, have any familiarity with these really rare subtypes, and we can, we can give you some guidance if you want to. So. so switching to genetic prion diseases, all genetic prion diseases are due to a genetic mutation of the prion protein gene. Um, there are about 40 different mutations. They're all autosomal dominant. Um, most of them are missense mutations. There are some insertions and some deletions. It's important to remember, though, that in the past we all thought that all genetic mutations of CJD were pretty much fully penetrant, so meaning that you had a 100% chance of developing the disease if you had the mutation. We now know that's not true. So there are some mutations where penetrance is actually quite low, and especially in New York audiences, I like to point out the V210I mutation, which is actually fairly prevalent in New York compared to other parts of the country. Um, there, Penetrance is about 10%. So oftentimes the scenario we'll see this is someone had a family member who died of CJD. They did the autopsy. The autopsy came back as genetic VG10I. And then, you know, the family wants to know, well, what do we do with that? Because uh, usually there's not a family history at all. Um, and it's important to be able to tell them what the penetrance is because a lot of uh, family members will want to seek asymptomatic testing. And knowing that penetrance is often very helpful in determining whether or not they want to know if they're a carrier or not. Um, a lot of times, uh, geneticists, when they meet with people for asymptomatic testing, will look up the penetrance. Uh, if you need assistance with knowing what the up-to-date penetrance is for any specific mutation, you can contact the center and we'll be happy to give you that information. Uh, so there are a couple of different clinical features of genetic prion disease. Uh, genetic CJD, as you would probably expect, is the one that most closely resembles sporadic CJD. So they have the classic CJD symptoms. They have a pretty quick duration of four to six months. Um, and a lot of their diagnostic test results are positive. So RT quick, MRI, uh, very closely resembles CJD. Fatal familial insomnia, as you can probably guess, generally presents with insomnia. And that's because they basically have um, very selective uh, targeting of the thalamus. 
So they basically lose their thalamus to prion disease. So they get a lot of autonomic dysautonomia as well. They get a lot of neuropsychiatric symptoms and they basically lose the hardware to achieve any slow wave sleep. Uh, so these patients are extremely groggy, but you put them on an EEG, they never actually achieve any REM or slow wave sleep whatsoever. Uh, they do sometimes develop other typical prion disease symptoms, but usually not till late in the disease. Uh, so dementia and myoclonus usually don't see it for the last few months of the illness. And they typically have a longer duration, usually longer than a year. Unfortunately, a lot of the uh, diagnostic tests that we use for CJD are negative in FFI. Occasionally, they'll have an MRI. Uh, RT-Quick tends to be negative. Um, so uh, it can be a tricky diagnosis to make based off what we have if you don't have history. Another genetic prion disease, gershman strauss schenker syndrome, or GSS, so we don't have to keep saying that, is a disease that really does not resemble prion disease at all, and that's because it's usually a long-duration illness. Most patients will live at least five years with it, um, and they typically present with a very isolated cerebellar or Parkinsonian syndrome that will extend for years before they develop any other symptoms. Um, a lot of times these patients are initially diagnosed as a spinal cerebellar ataxia and uh, you know, they go to a movement disorders or genetics clinic and whatever the number of SCAs that we're up to now, I think it's 25, they'll do the genetic testing and it's negative and someone will think of, well, maybe it could be GSS and they do the genetic testing and it comes back positive. Uh, a lot of the diagnostic markers that we have for CJD are also negative in GSS but not to the extreme that you see if FFI. Uh, about 30% will have a positive MRI. Thankfully, rt quick is positive in about 70% of GSS cases. But these, I think, are very hard uh, diagnoses to make because they don't look like prion disease. So I think they're probably under-ascertained. So one could ask, well, why would you want to know whether or not you have a mutation for prion disease, which is completely untreatable and fatal and uh, neurologically devastating? And uh, of course, in the past, we would say, uh, just because sometimes people just want to know for a variety of reasons, like financial planning, family planning, uh, or they want to participate in research. Nowadays, it's kind of science fiction, but it's not fiction. Uh, a lot of our families are doing pre-implantation genetic diagnosis with IVF, where they go to IVF centers and uh, they have their embryos tested for the prion protein gene, and they only implant the embryos that don't have the mutation. So it essentially eliminates the genetic illness from their family after them. Obviously, there are uh, religious um, implications of this. Not everyone would want to do something like this. It's very personal, um, but it is something that we always make sure we tell people. Um, and you see this in a lot of other genetic diseases now as well. So Alzheimer's, frontal temporal dementia, uh, very prevalent in Huntington's disease. Um, just another thing we can offer people. So switching gears to acquired prion diseases, uh, this includes Kuru, iatrogenic CJD, and variant CJD. So Kuru, I think everyone's done eating, so it'll be safe to talk about it, so I put it later in the talk. Uh, so Kuru is really, um, when we first discovered the transmissibility of prion disease, in the 1950s, there was this very obscure disease that affected the 4A tribe in Papua New Guinea, that only affected women and children and intended to have a rapidly progressive ataxia dementia syndrome. It initially attracted the attention of a lot of genetic NIH researchers who thought it was some type of weird inherited disease, um, but they couldn't really determine any inheritance pattern or genetic mutation. Uh, interestingly enough, when Australia colonized Papua New Guinea, the anthropologists got involved because uh, Papua New Guinea is extremely interesting from an anthropological perspective. There's actually more uh, languages on Papua New Guinea than anywhere else in the, con in the world combined. Um, and they discovered a very important piece, and that is that as part of their death rituals, they would consume their loved one. So after their loved one died, they would consume their loved one out of respect. And generally, it was only the women and young children who partook in the mortuary feasts. So... Um, what probably happened is someone in this tribe had CJD and then out of respect for their loved one, they consumed them and then basically perpetuated uh, Kuru amongst its species. So once uh, Australia 
outlaw cannibalism, uh, you saw much less cases of Kuru. It was also important because that also gives us a sense of the incubation period. So we've seen incubation periods of up to 52 years from the time of an exposure to a mortuary feast to the time that they became ill with Kuru. So we really learned a lot about the transmissibility of prion diseases and unfortunately that very long incubation period of prion diseases from Kuru. So of course you could also have iatrogenic prion disease in a similar fashion. Thankfully we don't see too many of these cases anymore. But in the past when we used a lot of cadaveric material in medical treatments, we saw much more of it. So corneal transplants transmitted CJD. Uh, we still use cadaveric corneals, uh, cornea, but they're all screened now for some type of neurologic syndrome. So if they die with any neurologic symptoms, their cornea can't be uh, donated. Um, in this country, probably most cases of iatrogenic CJD occurred due to human growth hormone. So there is a government-sponsored program that took uh, human growth hormone from cadaveric pituitaries, and most cases were given to children of short stature. Um, they batched all of the human growth hormones. It only really, really took one or two cases of contaminated uh, human growth hormone to contaminate huge batches. Um, so uh, we still occasionally see these cases. So um, last, at the end of last year in New York, we actually had a case of iatrogenic CJD from human growth hormone, and her incubation period would have been about 42 years. So very, very long. Um, we now use recombinant. Um, human growth hormones, we don't see, you know, at least the exposures now, but still the long incubation period. Uh, the other most common cause of iatrogenic CJD in this country were duramatter grafts, which were uh, in the past largely taken from cadavers. Um, you still actually can still get cadaveric duramatter, um, but most people in this country use synthetic, so we don't see um, as much of that anymore. You'll see at the very end we have blood transfusion. That is a very specific case scenario for variant CJD. Uh, so there's no epidemiologic evidence that sporadic or genetic prion disease can be transmitted by blood transfusion, but there is epidemiologic evidence that variant CJD can be. And we'll talk about some of the implications of that. So variant CJD, again, is CJD due to eating meat contaminated with mad cow disease. Uh, interestingly, millions of people were probably exposed to mad cow disease, but luckily to date, only 231 cases of variant CJD have been recognized worldwide. The mad cow epidemic uh, predominantly affected the UK, so the majority of cases happened in the UK, followed by other European countries. You'll see that the US has um, four cases of variant CJD, but all of those were thought to have been acquired overseas. So two of them were UK residents, one of them uh, was thought to have acquired it in Saudi Arabia because they received a very large shipment of contaminated meat and, uh, meat and bone meal from the UK. And uh, the last one, we kind of don't know where they got it from because they traveled so extensively, but incubation period-wise, it didn't appear that it was uh, US acquired. Uh, fortunately, we're not really seeing many more cases of variant CJD. Our last case worldwide was three years ago. Um, it, so that that's good. Variant CJD, also is a very kind of unusual clinical manifestation of prion disease. They occur in young people, so teens, 20s, 30s. They have a long duration, usually longer than a year, and their initial symptoms typically are psychiatric or sensory in nature, uh, and then the typical dementia symptoms of uh, dementia, ataxia, myoclonus don't happen until later on. Uh, typically, they're 14.33 and they're RT quick or negative. Um, their MRIs look different compared to sporadic CJD. So if you remember the last MRI, since you had hyperintensity in the um, basal ganglia and in the cortex, in variant CJD, they have a very specific finding of hyperintensity in the pulvinar nucleus of the thalamus. We call this the uh, pulvinar sign or the hockey stick sign because it kind of resembles uh, a woman's hockey stick. A very specific for variant CJD. You will sometimes see this finding in sporadic CJD but you'll almost always see it in conjunction with either, either basal ganglia or cortical hyperintensity as well. So if you look at the uh, variant CJD epidemic, the mad cow epidemic or BSE epidemic primarily happened in the 1980s when they had the suspicion that um, BSE was being transmitted to humans. 
they instituted what's called a feed ban in 1996. So interestingly, um, mad cow disease isn't naturally transmitted to other cows. It was a man-made phenomenon. We were basically causing a kuru epidemic in cattle. So what had happened is probably one case of BSE happened in a cattle, and then it was refed to other cattle and perpetuated the disease that way. So once they stopped refeeding uh, animal proteins to other animals, it kind of stopped the transmission in BSE. Um, and there are still all those rules, by the way, you're not allowed to have those kind of materials. And, and human food are also in feed to other mammals. You can see the incubation, mean incubation period is about 10 to 15 years, but there's been a steady decline of variant CJD cases. Um, but like Kuru, like iatrogenic CJD, we probably will continue to see cases of variant CJD every few years, probably for the next couple of decades because of the long incubation period. We see these purple caps here. These are transfusion, uh, blood transfusion, transmitted cases of variant CJD. Variant CJD is a very um, different strain of prion disease because it tends to reside outside uh, the CNS. It also resides in lymphoreticular tissue, so tonsils, appendices, malt tissue, spleen, and that's the thought of why it's transmissible via blood. So the one thought is if you know, millions of people were exposed, and we only have had 231 cases, how many people may be asymptomatically incubating the disease? So uh, interestingly, we, we could actually determine that, and the UK did this, by looking at a large swath of appendices in the UK. So they looked at over 30,000 appendices, stained them for the abnormal prion protein, and they found 16 positive cases. And these were cases that actually did not develop variant CJD. So these are asymptomatic people. Um, <laughs> interestingly and confusingly, uh, there was no difference by birth cohort. So it didn't matter whether or not you were born before or after the BSE epidemic, which is a little curious. We still don't have an explanation for that. Um, it didn't matter your genetic makeup. So typically variant CJD was very strongly represented in a certain genetic polymorphism. Um, but people that were asymptomatically affected um, represented all polymorphisms. So statisticians estimated a uh, prevalence of asymptomatic infection about 1 in 2,000. So obviously the vast majority of these individuals will not get ill, um, but they could potentially transmit the disease via blood transfusion. So uh, at least the two individuals that I spoke to this morning that had been UK residents, this is why you can't get blood. <laughs> Um, because of the potential we'll transmissibility. <laughs> um, so. so fortunately, we don't really have a bunch of mad cow disease in this country, but unfortunately, we do have a pretty endemic prion disease of deer and elk called chronic wasting disease. And in my opinion, this is probably one of the scariest prion diseases because it's very virulent amongst its own species. So as I said before, mad cow disease was not transmissible to other cows naturally. But in chronic wasting disease, it's excreted in their urine, their saliva, and their feces, and extremely transmissible to other cervid species. Um, and as I said before, prions are very hardy souls. They're very hard to degrade. So they're being you know, excreted in the environment, probably contaminating the environment for decades. Um, and then other animals can come behind and, and graze in those fields that have been contaminated. And to make matters worse, you know, cervids, deer, and elk are free-ranging animals, so you can't corral or call them like can cattle. So what we've basically been seeing for the last decade or two is this expansion of chronic wasting disease amongst uh, the states. And in fact, recently, uh, the last couple of years, we've seen cases in Norway and Finland. And the idea was because it is transmissible in urine, as it was thought that a hunter had imported urine from the U.S. that was contaminated to use as a scent attractant, and that was enough to contaminate uh, reindeer and elk in Norway, and now they have a huge epidemic to deal with. So we don't have any epidemiologic evidence that it is transmissible to humans, but as we said before, the incubation period for these diseases are extremely long, so we're probably not going to know for decades. Um, the one thing that I think is important to remember is that uh, prions have strains, kind of like other infectious agents, 
And as you know, with other infectious agents, the more virulent that strain is, the more likely it is to adapt and to change. So even though the initial CJD isolate may not have been transmissible to humans, that may change over time given its virulence. So this is probably um, one of the main focus of the uh, Prion Center is to try to determine whether or not chronic wasting disease is being transmitted to humans. And this is why it's really important to try to get autopsies on cases, because the only way we can really determine where prion disease is coming from is by looking at the brain tissue. So that's also true for variant CJD. Um, you heard about how it's kind of hard to diagnose. And uh, variant CJD lo looks very different underneath the microscope compared to sporadic and genetic prion disease. So the expectation is chronic wasting disease is also going to look different underneath the microscope. That's probably the only way we're going to be able to determine. So we really, really uh, appreciate any autopsy referrals you can give to us so that we can do surveillance of this. Uh, so experimental treatments, um, easy topic. There have been a couple experimental trials looking at quinacrine, tricyclic compounds, doxycycline, pentosin polysulfate. These were all targets against the conversion of the prion protein into the abnormal prion protein, so it wasn't for any antimicrobial effect of the agent. Uh, they were all negative, unfortunately. Um, I do think there is some sense of optimism. We're a little bit fortunate in that we kind of have a simplistic disease model for prion disease in that you absolutely need the normal prion protein to have disease. So if you take an animal model and you knock out the prion protein, they're completely resistant to infection and they can't get sick. So in a human, if we were to deregulate or block production of the normal prion protein, either at the DNA or RNA level, you could potentially remove that substrate and remove you know, fuel from the fire, um, potentially slow down the disease, maybe in genetic mutation carriers, delay or prevent the onset of illness. So um, we do have some monoclonal antibodies directed against the normal prion protein as well as some antisense oligonucleotides, and I think in the next two years you're going to be seeing some treatment trials with that. So I do think there is some, um, you know, reason for some optimism despite the pessimistic results that we've had in the past. But it's important to remember in this disease it's extremely devastating. Uh, these people's quality of life is extremely horrendous. And survival time is not really a reasonable endpoint for a treatment study in prion disease because even if you extend survival, the quality of life generally will be extremely poor. So what this also means, to treat symptomatic prion disease, you have to diagnose them extremely early if you're going to uh, extend survival time because that's going to, again, affect their quality of life. So it's important to keep that in mind. Switch a little bit the... What time do you guys usually stop? 11.30. 11.30. Time is enough. No, we, we usually wrap up right around 9. So we, oh, okay. we leave about 10 minutes for questions. Okay, yeah. thank you. So we're, we're doing pretty good then. 11.30. Prion disease care and management. Um, so for you guys, you're probably going to see most of your cases during this diagnosis phase. Um, and uh, you, know, you, you usually admit this patient. They have rapidly progressive dementia. You're doing a million dollar workup. You know, of course, half that million dollar workup is a send out lab. Uh, so just, you know, be mindful of the family members and make sure that they're aware of kind of what you're ordering, why you're ordering, uh, you know, that it's going to take time for some of these tests to come back. Um, don't forget about the patient's present needs. These diseases change very quickly. You may admit them and then two days later, any symptomatic treatment for myoclonus or something else that they didn't have at all when they initially presented. Uh, refer to organizations and clinicians familiar with the illness. You have a lot of uh, clinicians familiar with CJD here in New York, uh, New York Presbyterian and Columbia. There's uh, two neurologists that, that see a fair amount of prion disease. Um, discharge planning. So um, it's my belief that um, once a patient's diagnosed with CJD, uh, the physician kind of has a moral obligation to at least discuss hospice. Um, so that should be done. And if the patient is agreeable to hospice, it really is helpful to try to arrange for that before they leave because it's such a rapidly progressive illness that if they're kind of left to do that when they go home, it's kind of not untenable you know, for them to do that because uh, they're so um, 
occupied with trying to care for their loved one who's changing daily. I find it very helpful to establish a key worker, especially the way medicine uh, works nowadays where people are rotating on and off service. A lot of times it's the primary care doctor or a resident who has interest in the case that wants to follow it over time. Um, because of all these send out tests, ours included, they take a time you know, to come back. You want to make sure someone's following up on them. Um, a lot of times what will happen is someone will order the CSF tests, they come back, but no one sees them and you know, no one gets the diagnosis. So having a key worker, I think, is helpful, not just for pre disease, but you know, for a lot of different illnesses. The caring phase, so this is after the patient's been diagnosed. Make sure you have frequent reassessment, symptomatic treatment. Again, their symptoms will change quite radically. Uh, they also are very sensitive to sensory stimuli. So uh, I once had a patient who their start on myoclonus was so bad that one day when we went in to see them, we turned on the light. Uh, they startled so bad they fell out of bed. So ironically, although these are very high fall risk patients and we have a tendency to want to put them near the nursing station, and some of them it may be better to put them down the hall because that change of shift uh, can be quite dramatic for them and, and really actually make them more of a fall risk. Um, so keep that in mind, especially with rounding as well. Um, you know, if you have a huge rounding team, that can really uh, be distressing to families and the patient itself. A care caregiver requirements, it's a very burdensome illness, and the patient's only going to do as well as the caregiver is. So uh, we often like to say that caregiver is also our patient. Uh, again, we talked about how important hospice is. Uh, symptomatic treatment, it's basically your tried and true geriatric medicine. So really try not to use medications if you don't need to. A lot of times you can make environmental modifications to treat a lot of symptoms like startle myoclonus. So try those first. If they don't help and you need to do a uh, medication, you know, start low and go slow. Uh, and also reevaluate frequently. It's not uncommon for a patient to need an antipsychotic at the beginning of the week, and then you can take it away at the end of the week because they had progressed past that stage of their illness. So afterwards, again, um, we strongly encourage uh, that you discuss post-mortem analysis with the patient. Uh, that's always helpful if you do that beforehand, um, because then they have time to prepare for that. We have time to get the paperwork done and set up everything beforehand. It just makes it much smoother for the family. Uh, make sure you frequently check in with the family and caregivers. Uh, I can almost guarantee in all patients, you will get a call back after the patient has died. And the caregiver will typically ask, you know, I was caring for my loved one this whole time, you know, changing their diapers, kissing them, and I realized this is a transmissible illness. Am I at risk? And it never really crosses their mind while they're caring for the individual because, again, they're so caught up with caring for their loved one. Um, but a lot of times they'll ask that after the fact. And the answer to that question is they're at no increased risk. Um, if a postmortem is performed, please make sure you communicate the results. We're not allowed to communicate the results directly to the family member. It has to go to the physician, and the physician has to convey the results. Um, if you have any questions about the autopsy results, you can always call us. We'd be happy to go over them in detail with you. Uh, of course, with postmortems, if you can do it in person, that, that's preferable. And encourage contact as needed. I'm just going to end with some infection precautions. So with routine clinical care, um, really standard precautions only. You have much higher chance of acquiring MRSA or the flu from these patients than any you know, negligible rich, uh, risk of actually getting prion disease. So there's no need for gowns, masks, or isolation, at least for prion disease itself. Um, and consider the family. So we hear sometimes stories where um, people tell the family that there's no risk, and then the next day the healthcare team shows up in moon suits, and, and the family's like, what gives? Um, so just keep that in mind. Uh, a lot of times people ask about LPs and CSF. So CSF is not considered a high infective, infectivity tissue. And importantly, LP needles aren't reused. You know, so after you use an LP needle, you usually put it in a sharp container, and that sharp container, usually the contents of which are incinerated, and that's appropriate. Uh, so you really don't have to do anything different for... Um, LPs in CJD cases. I do my LPs in them the same that I do in any of my other patients. Um, however, that's very different if you're dealing with high infectivity tissue. So that would be CNS tissue. Uh, 
So that would be in a neurosurgical operating theater and a neuropathology suite. Um, you do have to take certain precautions. Um, instead of delineating what they are, it's probably more helpful to actually tell you where to look for them. Um, you can find several different guidelines for that. WHO has several. CDC has several. Um, and basically, it um, involves either discarding the equipment, doing high temperature autoclaves repeatedly, or sodium hydroxide. So in summary, uh, diagnosing CJD can be difficult and frustrating, although hopefully um, you guys took away that we have some, some a little bit better tools than what we had in the past that might be more helpful for you. So hopefully it's not as frustrating as what it has been in the past. Um, I think getting a proper diagnosis and managing the care of a patient with CJD can be stressful just because everything's moving quickly and everyone has questions. Um, but it's doable, and I think it actually is extremely rewarding. Um, care and management of patients with prion disease is mainly supportive. Hopefully that will change over time. And there are some several disease-specific interventions. And of course, um, you know, cl uh, routine clinical care is just standard precautions only. So if you leave nothing else from today, know that there are a lot of resources for prion disease in this country. Um, so the CJD Foundation, again, is a patient advocacy organization. They're very helpful for clinicians, but for family members. Um, I think they definitely have um, the most layperson-friendly literature of anywhere out there on their website. Um, it's a hard disease to understand, I think, even for us. But imagine being a family member trying to understand transmissible proteins. Uh, so I think they do a good job with that. Um, they also will be helpful, I think, in, in holding the family's hand for you. So a lot of times we don't have that time, uh, and they can be helpful with that. So they kind of have a social service role, if you will. Um, they um, have a support group here in New York City, uh, which they host at Caring Kind, which used to be the Alzheimer's Association. So again, everyone thinks that's oh, a rare disease, but they have enough to support a local support group, so it can't be that rare. Um, for those people that can't travel to a local support group, uh, the foundation does have monthly or bi-monthly uh, teleconference support groups that they can call into, which I think are helpful. Uh, the surveillance center is, is here for your needs. Uh, we do uh, CSF testing, testing if you want to see if someone has a mutation or not, uh, whether or not they don't think they're going to do autopsy or if they want to see if they're an asymptomatic mutation carrier. We have a free MRI consultation program, so if you want us to look at an MRI, we'd be happy to do that for you. Um, we also have the free autopsy coordination service, so if you're interested in that, just let us know. We'll coordinate everything, um, and also uh, the CDC covers all the charges. Part of that autopsy, you'll get whether or not it was prion disease, you'll get the type, but also importantly for the family is you will get genetic testing as well as part of that, and that can be really helpful for the family to know that. Um, and again, we're always willing to help you out with cases if, if you need some guidance with things. Uh, CDC also has really uh, good information. They posted the new diagnostic criteria about a month ago. Um, and then, of course, your local public health department also has a lot of experience with prion disease, and they can be quite helpful as well. So thank you for your attention. This topic comes up about every 10 or 15 years of time. And so this happened in the 1980s. Uh, the famous choreographer, uh, George Bowers, who passed away here, was at the hospital at the time. At the time, I'm talking about the illness. But uh, two of the doctors here at Roosevelt took care of him were very assiduous, uh, uh, Edie Langer. And they made sure about the autopsy. And I would just call him and, and, and ultimately he died with his PSS. And I would just call your attention to a fascinating article in the New York Times by Larry Alden about 
autopsy conference tomorrow for the autopsy conference, uh, which is exactly a year after the schedule. So it's very fascinating. I know that you are going to be back, and many people in our room did that since we don't cycle through this but once a decade. No, no, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I didn't know that, actually, that it was here. And that New York Times article actually is very excellent, so I'd highly recommend it. Um, oh, this is it looks like. Do, you, do you believe that the disease is underdiagnosed? The other question I have is actually a mechanics one. Do these patients die mostly at home? And if that's the case, what are the mechanics of contacting you and contacting transport of these bodies for the appropriate uh, testing to be done? So the first question was whether it's underdiagnosed. I, not to kind of have a weird statement, but I think it's both underdiagnosed and overdiagnosed. Um, as a clinician, I prefer that it be underdiagnosed because overdiagnosis usually means it's uh, treatable illnesses are being missed. Um, so we received 10,000 samples over the last three years of CSF. Only 10% are positive. Um, for autopsies, usually 70% are positive, 30% are negative. And again, unfortunately, in some of those negative autopsies, there are treatable illnesses. Usually it's uh, some type of neoplasm, occasional be meningitis, unfortunately, uh, CNS ripples we've seen. Uh, autoimmune encephalopathy. So unfortunately, sometimes it's treatable illnesses. Um, I do think there are certain populations that are definitely underdiagnosed. So I think the rare, rare subtypes that were not as good as capturing our diagnostic tests of GSS, I think is probably underdiagnosed. And I also think prion disease in older populations are probably underdiagnosed because maybe it's assumed that they have Alzheimer's disease with a a superimposing delirium, and that's why it's rapidly progressive. And then the second question was mechanics. Um, I think it's probably half and half where people pass. So half will pass um, at home in in home hospice, um, and then the other half will die, unfortunately, during the workup inpatient. Um, the mechanics are just go to the CJD surveillance website, there's a phone number there. Call us again if you can do it beforehand. We set up the transportation, we talk to the funeral home, we have a mortician or a neuropathologist agree to do the autopsy, all that's taken care of ahead of time for you. You just have to notify us that they passed and then we get that in motion. If for whatever reason uh, you don't have time to do that ahead of time, um, if you still call us, we'll still set all that up for you. Um, the only requirement is for whatever reason, it's at the very last minute, you know, 2 a.m. on a Saturday, the only thing you need to remember is the body needs to go in refrigeration, and then we can take care of it the next day. Um, is there any religious limitations to, to this process? In some Orthodox uh, religions, it's very difficult. Yeah, that's a great question. So we, we do see that. Um, a lot of times, uh, we'll suggest that they talk to their rabbi, uh, and my understanding is that um, there generally is a uh, exclusion for for research purposes, uh, for surveillance. Uh, so oftentimes, they'll get religious permission for that. Um, but it, of course, that's very personal. So it's up to you know the family and you know, their spiritual advisor. Uh, it's also cultural as well. So um, for example, a lot of Asian countries don't do autopsies. Um, so I think in China alone, they've only had ten autopsies in the last ten years. So that's also a limitation as well. But, you know, we, we try to work with the family wishes as much as we can. I was curious about the appendices that you mentioned. I realized there you're talking about variants of GP, such as Scotia's talking about the abstract absence of variants. But the fear of the person is not just a variant. That's true. So we do need a CNS biopsy to get to the diagnosis. Yeah, so that's an excellent question. Um, so we know in variant CJD, it's in high quantities outside the CNS. And it's exactly for the reason you know you brought up, because it's orally transmitted, probably gets taken up in the malt tissue and then you know retrograde 
transport through the vagus nerve. Um, which, by the way, there are similarities with that with Parkinson's, but I won't go there. Um, there is belief that chronic wasting disease would be similar because it would be an orally transmitted disease. So in cases that we know have had exposure to venison in highly endemic CWD areas, we are also collecting lymphoreticular tissue. So we collect uh, appendix, spleen, and periaortic lymph nodes. Um, so rt quick is very powerful. One of the downsides with that, that powerfulness is that now we're doing rt quick on every tissue. So uh, you know, in the last year, there have been articles on positive rt quick in skin of sporadic CJD and vitreous. Um, what's important to remember is that this is an extremely uh, powerful test that can really amplify very minute amounts of prions. And if there was, I think, a transmissibility risk in that, the epidemiology would be quite different, right? And we're not, just not seeing that. And the general surgery does not appear to be a risk factor for CJD in, in many studies done worldwide. Um, so, you know, there may be, if you will, a minimal infectious dose. Um, but you can find uh, rt quick positive uh, results in other tissues, but I don't know, you know, what that means by transmissibility risk because that doesn't play out epidemiologically. Whereas it does with Marin CJD. Uh, I, I thank you for a wonderful talk. I know from my own uh, personal experience that uh, the specific rare disease, there can be issues with kind of competing registries. And I'm just curious to hear your thoughts about that sort of broadly. And also, who is the possessor of the registry for these diseases? Is it the foundation? Is it the CDC? How do you manage that? Is it your own organization? So by registry, what specifically are you referring to? Uh, historical tracking of patients known to have a disease. OK. So I guess in our field, we have a, a couple of different registries that may apply. Um, usually people think of the tissue. So we store all the tissue that we get. So we have the tissue since 1997, something like 7,000 brain CSS specimens. So we keep that. Um, we do offer that to um, researchers. You know, that kind of one of our purposes is to help facilitate research in this disease. Um, the data that we collect, like number of positive cases and the breakdown, that's always published online uh, at that website, so you can see that. Uh, CDC, they report um, estimated prevalence on their website. They do it a, a variety of different ways. They use the surveillance center data, and they also look at death certificate registries, and they calculate the estimated incidence. So they publish that graph online. And then they're pretty good. About every five years, they try to write a journal article that kind of summarizes what's been found. Um, so, and you'll also see information on, you know, the breakdown of variant CJD, iatrogenic CJD in our country. Uh, there is a relatively new patient registry that patients can sign up for, for research studies. Um, it's quite actually interesting to see because, you know, I've seen kind of competition in other diseases. Uh, they all came together. Uh, it was a uh, uh, husband and wife that's been in the news. And she has FFI. And they found out she had the mutation. They completely changed their career track and actually went back to school to become prion researchers. And they actually started this registry. But they included kind of all the stakeholders, so the CJD Foundation and, um, and the CDC and a few of us that do clinical research. And uh, their research registry is uh, housed at the Broad Institute, but it's, it's pretty open. Uh, we all have say in kind of how that's used. So it's, it's really been a lot of collaboration, I think, in this field. You're always going to have some exceptions, right? Um, but, you know, we realize that it's such a rare disease that we, we really do have to cooperate and share. So. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.